20 odd years ago I made my first solo album. That was called El Gringo Retro, but I'm not here to talk about that. Today I'm here to talk to you about Songs from the Blue Room, which is my new album, forthcoming if you will. And uh, just to kind of give you a kind of track by track, song by song guide, run through, and we're going to talk about the artwork as well, as that's all part of the, the lovely creative process. So here we go, Songs from the Blue Room. So I Want to See the Light is really written about the dark days of Covid and the pandemic when people couldn't get out and see each other and uh, it's a pretty, pretty tough time for a lot of people. But the song itself is a kind of positive, forward looking thing about you know when we get through this and things are going to be better and uh, and it's a nice up tempo, kind of very direct song, of course it's very kind of straightforward and it's, it's a good toe tapper and I think that sort of made it the perfect contender really to be the opener of the album and uh, kind of eases you into the whole thing musically. So the first single from the album was called Killed by Cobain and that's an interesting song because it sort of describes what we as Thunder went through in 91, 92 with grunge kind of blowing everything else out of the water in America and our timing was appallingly bad and we never really got started again after that. But, you know, I've learned to kind of live with that and laugh at it now, ha ha ha. And uh, this song is kind of me kind of exercising those demons, if you like, and getting out of the system. Uh, honestly, it's quite tongue in cheek. Uh, and that's the music business. Some days it's good, some days it's bad, some days it's even bloody worse. But, you know, coping with disappointment, that's what all young musicians need to learn. If you can cope with the disappointment, you'll be alright. Errol Flynn. What's this song about? Well, Errol Flynn was obviously famous for lots of things, um, mainly his drinking and uh, womanizing and partying. And I guess what this song is doing is addressing the fact that as, a, as an aging man, you know, none of us can afford to act like we did when we were 21. And it's coming to terms with that, dealing with it, and, and sort of looking back at your life with a bit of nostalgia, saying those bits were good and oh dear I messed that bit up or that bit was great and whatever and it's something that those of us who are lucky enough to re reach a ripe old age can do. I'm just grateful that I've got here to 63 years old and I can do that. A um, little bit about me, a little bit about my father too. There you go, they're all for him. Okay, I know what I'm going to say, I've got it. Got it. And action. So damage is really all about a very, very one-sided relationship where one person does all the giving, the other person does all the taking. And the song's from the point of view of the person doing all the giving and wondering why the more affection and love and everything pours into this woman, the less she gives her monkeys. Yes, so it's not a very pleasant relationship thing, but I've done it with a slightly tongue-in-cheek attitude and um, hopefully people will see that. And it bounces along in the kind of almost like a sort of McCartney-ish, beatly kind of piano riff, which is interesting, so I don't normally write the piano. So this was a fun one to write, um, and it's hopefully a jaunty little pop song. So, Nobody Cares. Hey, what an unusual song. It, it's odd, it's in Malt's time, which is very odd anyway. And it's got this kind of Eastern European, Greek or Russian melody running through the chorus, and I've literally no idea where that came from. Sometimes as a writer, things just fall out of you and you think, oh my God, what's that? Did I give birth to that? And it's, it's a bit like that. But it's interesting. It's, it moves in odd ways and has an odd change of key in the middle. And uh, it's an interesting, interesting mess. Um, lyrically, it deals with something that really grinds my gears, um, which is mundanity on social networks. By that, I mean like when people take a photograph of their dinner and go, here's my dinner. I don't want to see a picture of your bloody dinner. I've got enough mundanity in my own bloody life, really to worry about other people's. I mean, why Did, would anybody think that anybody cared? Ah, that's the title, nobody cares. Oh, I certainly don't. One of the really nice things, uh, things that I really enjoy in my life is actually going somewhere warm, looking at the sea, having a cold beer. I don't think that's unusual. I think lots of people like that. It's the unwinding thing. And Watch the Sun Go Down is really about exactly that. It's about getting away from the, the rat race, the everyday kind of pressures and, and things that annoy you and, and just going somewhere where you, your only responsibility to yourself is to enjoy it, chill out, relax and watch the sun go down. Okay. 
Cry Like Rain is, is I can't know, it's, a very, it's a sad song. It's about losing somebody very, very close. Um, and it's something that, obviously, the older I've got has happened to me more and more, uh, which is inevitable. Um, uh, I'm not unique in that. Um, everybody has to go through these things. But that terrible sadness when you realise that you're not going to see somebody again, uh, especially if it's somebody you're really, really close to. Um, I think it's something that lots of people can relate to. Um, and it's got a really kind of beautiful guitar solo in it, which, funny enough, I didn't play. <laughs> it's played by my old friend Tony Myers. Um, and it's beautiful, and it kind of weeps. That's the only way I can describe it. Um, and it, it's lovely, and it just fits the song beautifully. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's sad, but it hopefully kind of uplifting as well. Lying to Myself has got a kind of country-ish, folkish kind of feel to it, I think. Built around the acoustic guitar, a bit of harmonica, it's got a nice sort of jaunty feel to it. And it's really, um, it's about my wife. Yes, it is. I think during COVID we spent a lot of time together and got a lot closer. I know it ruined relationships for a lot of people, but it affected us in a pretty positive way. Um, and, you know, I suppose it's also acknowledging the fact that there are lots of men are useless without women, and I'm probably one of them. So there you go. So, I'm the one you want is really a really simple song. There's not a great deal to say about it, really, other than what, other than it's kind of it's based about around the groove. It's bluesy. It's a bit R&B in the old sense of the word. And probably the closest uh, that I get on the album to being um, like Thunder, which is obviously my day job. Um, so it's hardly surprising, I guess, in a way. But lots of kind of cool guitar riffs and. Um, Lots of fun this one, lots of fun. If I do some gigs, I really look forward to playing this one live. Don't be long. Don't be long. Somebody said to me, what's this song about? And I said, well, it's really, really simple. Imagine that your wife is an astronaut. That's it. Oh, all good. Lady cup of coffee. Ha. Huh? Ah, uh -huh. as you can see, mate. Very nice. Good, very good. nice. So, so we're here to talk about the artwork and, and um, the conceptualising and the realisation thereof. So, um, the cover's fantastic. It's one of the best things I think you've ever done. Thanks, mate. Um, and it's lovely, but it wasn't the original idea, was it? No. Um, songs from the Blue Room. Um, you know, when you first you know told me about the idea uh, initially, you know, with the album being, you know conceptualized and created during lockdown in your in your studio at home which is painted blue so clever the idea as simple as it was was to take you know, your studio as it were and let's put it somewhere kind of obscure isolated as we kind of were during lockdown so initially the idea was you know we would have a little small room set made you know and put it somewhere obscure you know like in the middle of the Atacama Desert, for example, but obviously budgets um, got in the way of that one. So <laughs> yes, they did a little bit. Yes. So we thought, you know, maybe, well, you know, um, you know, we could try it in the middle of a forest, you know, maybe like Epping Forest, and we'll have a room set made, um, paint it all blue, add the chairs and the furniture, get the guitar in. So essentially, like, like a room in the middle of a forest. Exactly, painted right, blue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Which was a good idea. It was. Um, uh, yeah, and still, you know, to this day, I think it would have been, I think it would have made a beautiful album cover anyway. Yeah. Um, I think now, as we kind of went through the process, you know, looking back when we went through the process of the logistics of making that happen, yeah. um, there was quite a lot, especially in terms of, you know, lighting it, you know, in the middle of nowhere. And because you're outdoors as well, you have to deal with the weather and the rain. Weather constraints and, you know, as well, yeah, especially in the yeah. UK, it would have been tough. Um, so, so we didn't do that. So then, um, so we didn't do that. How did you come up with the uh, the idea that we actually did did use? So we, there was um, there was a magazine article I saw in um, it was in um, I think it was in Wallpaper magazine, um, and it was this it was this beautiful housing uh, housing estate. Um, it's called um, La Marella Roja. Um, and ten out of ten for pronunciation. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Struggling with that. I La Marella Rocha, and it was designed uh, by this Spanish architect, uh, Ricardo Bofill, uh, in 1973, um, and it was 
it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, um, stunning piece of architecture. It's all painted in beautiful colours, like massive oranges and reds, but the atrium, the centre core of this, of this building, is blue. Which is very convenient. Very convenient. <laughs> um, otherwise, you know, a repaint job would have been very expensive. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the core of it um, just lent itself perfectly to this. It was very kind of self-contained. Um, and the intricacies of the design, you know, there were steps going up here, steps going up here. It had a touch of... Isha. Isha, yeah, completely. Yeah, I mean, it was yeah, just yeah. like, which way is up and down? Are they all connected? Where does it start? Where does it stop? Wasn't yeah, it also, I think I'm correct in saying that um, the guy who was the production designer um, on Squid Games, was his production design was very influenced by that building. Is that correct? Or yeah, yeah, well, al allegedly. Um, I think it was the, the penultimate episode of Squid Game and they're all going up and down steps and, it, you know, the basis of the, I suppose, the inspiration came from this building. Yeah. Um, so we were lucky. Yep. I mean, we went there, we shot it. We had... Um, you know, beautiful weather. Um, I thought what was really interesting about it actually is that all the time we were shooting, because people live in it, because it's actually a functioning apartment block, uh, you'd be in the middle of a shot and you'd be setting it up and then somebody would walk past with their dog or their shopping and go, ah, when it started, you know, whatever. So that was kind of interesting and I made for it. <laughs> but also spont spontaneity. Yeah, but made it real. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're in someone's, you know, basically someone's back garden. Yeah, uh, yeah And, sure. you know, I think there was quite a few you know, lovely little old Spanish ladies, and we're constantly asking, oh, you know, can you close the shutters? That's you right. know, because yeah. we don't want to see you in the shot, and <laughs> um, so that we kind of kept that minimal, you know, aesthetic. And the great thing is, then as soon as we put you in there in that, you know, cream linen suit against the blue, you had to pop out, and it just, it, it wasn't kind of like, you know, where's Wally? It, it you know, the, it, it was very easy to yeah. hone in and almost make you leap out of this, you know, blue environment. And I, I think it worked. I mean, I love the shot. I really do. Um, I think it's a corker. And, and uh, you know, I think there's been lots and lots of, obviously, the album, as we're having, having this conversation, the album actually isn't released yet, but it will be in a couple of weeks. So, um, but the artwork is out there and people are already commenting on it and, and saying it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very beautiful and very attractive. So it's all, it's all very, very good. And uh, who knows, mate, we might make the vinyl awards again this year. Woohoo! Yeah. yeah. So yeah, if uh, yeah, if it does make the nominations, you know, please vote for us. Um, <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, we need that trophy. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. It's been emotional. Bye bye. Get down from your bar stool, Errol Flynn.